Well, good Wednesday evening. We are back in the book of Habakkuk tonight, so grab your Bible, open it to chapter 3. As we got into this book, we saw the prophet asking God, why don't you do something? And God said, I am doing something. And when you hear about it, you're, you're not going to believe it. God showed Habakkuk how the nation of Judah, the people of Israel, were being judged by God for their unfaithfulness and for breaking the covenant. God was going to use the very worst people, the Babylonians, as instruments of that judgment. What? Why? Do you not know how bad they are? Habakkuk asks. We saw Habakkuk go up to a high place and watch to see how God would respond. And again, the Lord answered and said, it is for you. It's your job as a prophet to watch and to wait and to write down the message. That message was really, as we looked at it, summed up with the words, the righteous will live by faith. The, the righteous will live by faith kind of is the key answer to so many of our questions about the working of God. We're to have faith that God knows and is acting. And then at the end of chapter 2, we saw five woes for the unrighteous person. And this was directed at Babylon. Habakkuk wanted to know if Babylon would prosper at the expense of God's people. And the answer was a resounding no. And then we come to chapter 3. I think the five woes in chapter 2 were enough to shake Habakkuk to his core. Verse 16 of chapter 3 pictures this for us. So let's start with that verse uh, because I think it sets the tone for the chapter. Chapter 3, verse 16 says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness comes into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come, on, to come upon people who invade us. The extent of God's judgment against Babylon was more than Habakkuk imagined. Every aspect of that great feared kingdom would be brought low. Habakkuk is left in the position of awe and respect at God and his power. I also think, or at least I wonder, is there a bit of embarrassment? Habakkuk had questioned if God was at work. He, he challenged God to do something. And now he sees how the mighty justice of God would be brought to bear. And it's important to note, I think, that he's reminded that God has worked in the past. Verse 1 tells us two things about the first parts of this chapter. It tells us two things about this whole chapter. This is a prayer, verse 1 tells us, and it's also a psalm, if you would. There are three things mentioned which point to this prayer becoming a part of worship. The first is in Habakkuk 1. In verse 1, it says, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shignioth. Now, that word, Shignioth, is used only twice in any form in the Bible. Here, it's a plural, and in Psalm 71, it's singular. It, it seems to indicate as a specific kind of song or a specific style of music. Also, three times in the body of this prayer, psalm, the word selah is used. Now, selah is used in the book of Psalms a total of 71 times, and there are various interpretations for its meaning. It, it may mean a pause or a, a rest, an inter, instrumental interlude. Uh, 
J. Vernon McGee, who many of you know from the radio program Through the Bible, said he thought this word meant a crescendo or uh, the musical term fortissimo. It meant big and loud. In his folksy way, he said it meant for the drummer to get with it. Then the very last line of this chapter, the very last line of the book, says that it should be played on stringed instruments and sung by a choir. This prayer slash psalm is filled with imagery and visualizes the deliverance of Israel from captivity in Egypt and the establishment of the nation. Now, that memory and what God said about Babylon are the reason for this psalm. So look at verse 2. O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O oh Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Perhaps... Habakkuk went back into the temple, and while he was watch, watching and waiting and mulling over the fate of the nation and of Babylon, he heard someone there in the temple recounting the history of the nation. Perhaps he could hear songs as he's up in the watchtower on the wall. Perhaps he could hear songs coming from the temple, which recounted the deliverance of God. Uh, perhaps this is just a reminder given to him by the Lord from what he already knew. Oh Lord, I have heard the report of what you have done and who you are. And he says, oh Lord, do I fear? Do I fear? It's not a question. Uh, if anything, it's an understatement. Fear, do I ever? Habakkuk has come back. He's, he's turned away from the arrogance of questioning God. He has turned away from the disrespect where he demanded of God. He's returned to the proper awe and respect that God deserves. God is the Lord in this psalm. If your Bible is like mine, the word Lord is all in capital letters. This indicates the formal name for God. God the Creator is God the Deliverer. The I Am, that's the formal name for God. The I Am is the ever-present God. The Lord, the Almighty, is the same God of the covenant. Habakkuk has come back to respect and awe for God and his power. He's again become aware of what God has done in the past on Israel's behalf. Verses 3 through 7 reminded the worshipers who heard or sang this prayer of the time back of Moses when God delivered the people from oppression and slavery and cruelty in Egypt. The, the words are filled with imagery and story. Moses was in the wilderness when God called him, he was in the region of Teman and Mount Paran. Biblical archaeologists believe Mount Paran is the same as Mount Sinai, as Mount Horeb, often called the Mountain of God. It was on the edges of that mountain that God spoke to Moses from the burning bush. And it was to that same mountain that God had Moses bring the people during the first stages of the Exodus. It was here on that mountain that God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. God is described in terms of power and wonder. His splendor was greater than anything on earth. His brightness is like the sun. The, the plagues which are mentioned here were a, a sign of God's authentic call for his people. And, and that's where the pestilence and the plague come in. His ways, we're told, are everlasting. 
God was reminded, or rather Habakkuk, Habakkuk was reminded of God's deliverance of the people out of Egypt. And his prayer was that God would once again deliver his people. The, the coming of the Babylonians was not something that Habakkuk himself could stop. So his prayer to God was for God to do it again. Re remember the heart of the prayers in verse 2. In the midst of the years, revive it. Habakkuk is saying, do it again, God. Do it again. In verses 8 through 15. God is seen as the mighty warrior fighting for his people. God's bow and arrows are instruments of his power. These are symbol of the tools, the weapons available to God. If needed, it shows us that God can shake and split mountains. I think the, the memories come back to the conquest of the land and the establishment of the nation in these verses. God's power was on display. When the walls of Jericho fell, God crumbled the walls. He shook the earth and the walls crumbled. Joshua and his army did not do anything. When, when called upon, God can divide and, and he can, his power is called upon. He can enable the rivers and the seas to be used. Right before Jericho, God split the Jordan River in half. And the people crossed over on dry land. Still thinking, as we read through here, still thinking of Joshua and the establishment of the nation, the Lord himself fought for the people to the point that the sun stood still in the sky for a day in Joshua 10, verse 13. In that same chapter, it describes that the Lord's power, uh, more of the enemy that day were killed by hailstones than by the swords of men. A special place is given for God's power in using the enemy against themselves. Verse 14 says, you pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors. There, there are several occasions in the Old Testament that come to mind when an enemy of Israel turned against themselves in confusion and violence. In that same 10th chapter of the book of Joshua, the enemy was thrown into confusion and more easily defeated. In 1 Samuel 14, the Philistines are battling themselves when Saul and the army arrive. In 2 Chronicles 20, the enemy of Israel, those enemies, rather than joining forces and coming together, they fought each other. And there are other times God's power can be seen to move mountains, to split rivers and seas, to flood lands, and to defeat enemies. God has and will again fight for his people. When we look over into the New Testament, the idea of using the tools of the enemy against themselves really comes out in a big way. God took the greatest weapon of the enemy and turned it to good. Satan's great weapon is the fear of death and the punishment for sin. His son, Jesus, God's son, Jesus, took our sin and our death and turned what Satan intended as a victory and he used it for our good. Jesus turned it back and made it the way of our salvation. What Satan intended for evil, God used for good. And I think Habakkuk would look at this and say, do it again, God, do it again. Now, look with me at verse 16. I hear, and my body trembles, my lip quivers at the sound, rottenness enters my bone, my legs tremble beneath me, yet I'll quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who 
invade us. All of these memories and the thoughts, the recognition of the power of God are awesome. Habakkuk is shaken to his core. He's weakened, and I believe he falls driven to his knees. Yet the fear passes, and, and rather than stay in that fear, his, his confidence returns, and it turns to worship. Rather than rail against God, rather than question God, Habakkuk will wait on God. And next week we'll see that this response is also a response of trust and especially of praise. Well, what about us? Have we given up on God? Have, have we challenged God to do something, do anything about our circumstances or about what's happening in our world? Like Habakkuk, we need to remember that God has worked for us in the past and will again. And rather than question God, we need to remember God and his blessings, his action, and especially his salvation. And like Habakkuk, we need to say, do it again, Lord. Do it again. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to look into this word and to, to be reminded of your greatness, your power, the all we should have to be reminded of how you work on our behalf, how you have in the past, how through Jesus we have salvation, and Lord, how you have delivered your people through the ages. And Father, we look, we see your hand at work in the world, and, and now we see the condition of our world. And we say, Lord, do it again. Do it again. You have healed Lord, we pray for those that are struggling with health issues right now. And we say, Lord, heal again. You have restored people back to you. And Lord, as, as believers are frustrated and demoralized by the things going on in their lives or by the condition of our world, Lord, we'd say, revive us again. Do it again, Lord. Encourage us again. Father, you have saved people who did not deserve salvation. And Lord, we would say, as we look around the people we know, do it again, Lord. Do it again. Father, our world needs what Jesus offered. And Lord, we know that he uses people like us to do that. And Lord, as we have been used, in the past, we would say also, do it again, Lord. Use us again to strengthen and encourage other believers, to challenge and witness to those who do not believe. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, friends. Have a great week.